Hello, everyone. I can see that a lot of people have already joined us. And I want to take time to thank all of you for deciding to spend next 45 minutes with us and learn more about digital identity that enables seamless onboarding. Uh, my name is Christina, and I run events here at Telesign. Uh, so we are doing this webinar live from our home, uh, so I apologize in case of any technical difficulties. Uh, today's session will be recorded and video will be available after the session. Uh, before we start, I would like to walk you through the agenda uh, that we've prepared for you today. Uh, first, uh, we will introduce Telesign very briefly, and then we will talk how digital identity solutions can be used to reduce onboarding risks and provide a seamless experience. Throughout the session, you can ask questions use, using Q&A section at the bottom toolbar. Uh, we will do our best to answer all of your questions during Q&A part. And at the end of the webinar, there will be a raffle where we will ask a question related to the topic uh, we've covered today. And the first correct answer will receive a prize in a value of $500. Uh, so let me introduce you to our speaker today. Uh, our speaker will be Abhijit Singh. Uh, you can see him on the screen. Uh, Abhijit is leading Telescience Mobile Identity Solutions for EMEA and APEC regions. And he's been working with companies from different industries to overcome fraud issues. Abhijit, you can say hi. <laughs> okay, uh, so let me just tell you a couple of words about Telescience. Uh, basically, Telesign bridges businesses with global telecommunications network. Uh, we are helping companies to identify and communicate and engage with their end users by leveraging data that Telesign has access to throughout our connection with telco operators. Uh, 20 out of 20 biggest web properties in the world trust Telesign to serve their global user base. Um, and uh, next, I will get. Uh, I will leave my colleague Abhijit to walk you through the history of Telesign. He Abhijit, you're hey. on mute. Hello, thank you, Christina, for such a nice introduction for both uh, myself and and Telesign. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thanks for joining in such uh, good numbers. I know that these are uh, a bit difficult times, but uh, I hope everybody is, is staying well uh, and safe. So uh, I'm not sure if you are aware of Telesign, but if you are not, I'll just give you a quick run through of who we are. Um, so if you, if you look at Telesign, Telesign was founded in 2005 with focus on providing uh, two-factor authentication to uh, online businesses. Yeah. Now, if you have ever received a one-time password for transaction verification or, um, you know, for, for account verification, there is a high chance that that one-time password may have passed through Telesign, yeah? Now, uh, moving beyond, you know, uh, the one-time password space, we actually have, uh, we actually started working with uh, a lot of online businesses to provide more information or identity information about phone numbers uh, starting 2010. <clears throat> And then in 2016, we started our communication business or our platforms, uh, which is more on to the communication as a platform space. Yeah. In 2017, something exciting happened where uh, one of the world's largest international communication enablers and one of the world's largest uh, telecommunication networks, Belgacom International Carrier Services, acquired us. Uh, they helped us in terms of expanding our reach, improving our coverage, and also providing more data points about phone numbers around the world, right? Now, so that's where we are right now, but going forward, we are also, we also have big plans of moving uh, away, uh, let's say moving beyond uh, phone numbers and going into uh, much, uh, let's say, broader spectrum of digital identity, yeah? So said that, and with this brief introduction of Telesign, let me get into the webinar itself. Now, to start the webinar, I'll take you back a few years, uh, not a few, actually 70 odd years, and, and I recommend a movie, which is titled A Stolen Identity. Uh, it, it is placed out of Austria, and it's, it's, it's a murder mystery, 
but the main crux of the movie or the storyline actually uh, revolves around stolen identity by which an innocent guy gets convicted of a murder, right? Now, while I was born in 1984, right? And, and um, for me, identity problems have been uh, quite new, but that has not been the case. I mean, this movie uh, reveals that identities have been under uh, issues or having their own verification problems since the time they, they actually came into existence, right? And, and considering the fact that we are into a world which is, uh, let's say, online, uh, where most of the things we do or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, use uh, actually have online presence, the verification part of a, a personal identity, actually the risk around that uh, run um, uh, at, at a much higher level. Now, let me uh, expand to what I'm, what I'm trying to say. So if you look at any businesses sign up page, yeah, this is how it normally looks like, like right? You have uh, the, some businesses which have sign up page, pages with very less information, just email, password, and confirm password. Now, this is the least friction way of getting a customer onboarded, right? So, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's very good for getting more customers on board, but you get very little information about the users themselves, right? Now, then you have uh, a more wider use of a sign-up page, which, is also, which also includes first name and last name at least ensure that when a customer is contacted by a customer service, they at least have a name to refer to, yeah? Now, that's, that's most of the businesses follow, yeah? But then you have a not so popular, but this was widely used a few years back, uh, is getting more details about the user at the time of onboarding itself, right? Uh, getting their address, getting their PIN codes, getting their phone numbers itself on the on the on the sign up page, right? Now uh, the the CX brigade or customer experience brigade was completely against it because that actually brought a lot of friction into the customer onboarding, and for for valid reasons, right? If you have to fill a form, if you uh, have to spend five minutes uh, filling up a sign up form, then if, if there is a competitive company or, or a competition with, with a lower onboarding frictions, uh, then the users are going to onboard that much more faster, right? So, but that raises its own challenges. So if you talk to different teams who deal with customers uh, within your organization, yeah, uh, you would actually understand that onboarding is not just about getting you know, uh, email address or, or name, first name and last name about a user. There are a lot of things which uh, these different teams within the organizations uh, expect to know about the user uh, before they even get them onboarded, right? So we all know that there are, there are bot checks or possession checks which have to be performed uh, and most of the businesses do that. So, um, I mean, if, if it is a, you know, a machine-induced sign-up attempt, or uh, to verify if an email or a phone number is actually being processed by the user to, uh, so a verification email is sent, then the point here is that, uh, but it doesn't just stop there, right? To, you have your fraud and risk teams which have to perform fraud checks. Uh, the, uh, you have your compliance teams which have to perform, you know, um, uh, account registration checks, KYC checks, uh, uh, address checks, uh, even the age sensitive uh, applications have to perform age check. And there are many other checks which uh, various different businesses have to perform at the time of onboarding, right? But, uh, in, but because, if you actually start collecting this information at the time of sign up page, then it becomes a big problem. So what do customers, what do businesses do? They do uh, introduce friction, but not at the time of sign up, but at the time of, you know, uh, when the customer is already onboarded. So once, once the phone number or the email is verified, they have these links, they actually send mails, they send other communications for the users to complete their profile, right? If it is 
a service which is sensitive to getting ID verification or address verification, they ask users to upload their um, you know, proof of address or uh, upload their ID uh, identification. There are uh, many cool services around that, uh, which, which actually help you identify user and, and do ID scans and things like that, right? But, uh, but apart from that, if the user doesn't fill it, then, then it's a problem. You don't know much about the user, right? And all these teams which rely on more data to make decisions, they actually, their work or their decision-making get, gets impacted, right? So if you look at uh, most of the onboarding processes, uh, I mean, they still revolve around bot check and, and position check. Um, and they look for a secondary way post registration to obtain uh, customer details if customer choose to provide that in, in the application. Now that actually, as I said, causes a lot of problem. Yeah, that causes a lot of work to be done by various different teams. Uh, again, for fraud risk and, and you know, uh, uh, for, for fraud risk uh, identification teams or let's say fraud management teams, it, it raises a big concern. Of course, they work on device IDs, uh, they work on, um, you know, email addresses, uh, uh, they work on IP addresses and intelligence around that, but, but sometimes that's not enough uh, if the fraudster is actually using something which is completely new uh, in terms of these data points. So considering that, I mean, it is expected by a business to collect all these intelligence data points about their users at the time of onboarding itself, it actually makes onboarding the single most complicated step in the user lifecycle. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, we currently make it, we try and make it way too simple, but it actually is the most complicated step in, in any user lifecycle because it actually helps you provide better service, uh, ensure that your business is not getting affected by fraud. And as I said, uh, and, and the current ways of providing frictionless onboarding actually is one medium by which the fraudsters are able to enter any businesses, online businesses ecosystem very, very easily. Yeah. Now, when I say easily, uh, let's look at some numbers, right? So if you look at uh, some of the industry studies, you'll find that around 20% of the online accounts in, in, uh, with various degrees of uh, you know, uh, uh, association with, with a, any industry, on an average, around 20% of online accounts are fake. Yeah, around 40% of online reviews, uh, maybe on e-commerce side or the, the website itself uh, are, are actually fake. So around 50% of the users, users like you and me also provide incorrect or, or false data or incomplete data towards the businesses. Yeah. Uh, in, and if you actually compare the number of illegitimate web pages or let's say accounts which are created, for valid online businesses on maybe social media or other ways of communication to, towards a user, you'll find that the illegitimate pages or accounts actually uh, overrun the, the valid or uh, legitimate account pages by 2.5 times. Yeah. So that's, that's, a, that's a huge problem because these illegitimate pages they are, or accounts, they actually contact valid users and people who are less informed to actually uh, and, and they try to impersonate the businesses and try to get, uh, you know, uh, uh, personal information out of them. It's like, uh, it, it, is, it is a very popular phishing um, strategy. Now, apart from that, uh, a very interesting uh, statistic here. One of the leading online social media uh, company actually removed 6.2 billion um, you know, fake accounts from their platform in just 1.5 years. That was around 2.5 times of their legitimate user accounts, which are present in, 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 on, their, on their platform. That's huge. That's like the population of the world itself, right? So, if, so that's, the, uh, that's the kind of problem which they were facing around fake and false accounts, uh, considering that they, are, they, they, they have all the money in this world to actually help uh, not 
or, or not to allow these these uh, fraudsters to to get in, right? So they have all the resources. They have, um, you know, uh, the, the 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 commercials which are uh, uh, needed to support that kind of uh, um, creates that kind of a barrier for the fake users to get in. But still, they are plagued by such a problem by a huge uh, number. Now, why do why do uh, these, you know, uh, users end up creating? fake accounts or provide false information or providing false or, or in incorrect data right now uh, we are we are all aware of problems like fake reviews and fake orders right uh, so fake reviews is to is to uh, uplift the rating of 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 a product or or a service on on maybe an e-commerce side and that's very very effective right uh, putting uh, or putting a fake orders uh, leads to an increase in reputation of a, of a particular product or uh, you know uh, of, of a particular uh, business or a restaurant on on any maybe delivery website or uh, let's say an e-commerce website it is used for phishing as i as i talked about it's used for spamming uh, interestingly it's also used for non-competitive behavior right um, if Fake orders are placed. May, if you if you look at any uh, delivery website, and if I am a competing restaurant, I I, I may end up uh, placing fake orders on the website and actually put up, you know, uh, bad rating for that that restaurant so that the restaurant business uh, gets affected or maybe eventually close. Uh, Promo abuse and referral abuse is also are also some big problems which uh, I mean which actually the users try and exploit. Uh, uh, by actually creating fake accounts, because by that they actually get the new user onboarding benefits. Impersonation, uh, business impersonation, or uh, the impersonation of a, of a user who is already there in the ecosystem is is quite popular. Uh, it, I mean, more often than not, than not, they actually entice the user to provide their personal details, or they uh, entice the customers to you know um i mean send money over they up they may appear like somebody from uh, let's say the support ecosystem of a business and they they can they can ask users to uh, you know do some test transactions or provide their pin numbers and and things like that to uh, to get hold of their their accounts yeah follower uplift uh, is is also very very popular we all are aware of it but one thing which is very interesting and has been coming up uh, a very you know, uh, at a very fast pace in the online world is the one-time password inflation attacks. Yeah, uh, you may. Uh, so this is something which I will get into a bit more detail in in the upcoming slide. But just keep that in mind. Now, apart from that, yeah. Okay, so we have uh, a poll in front of you. Maybe we can take a few seconds to answer uh, this poll. Okay. So, if uh, so, apart from the problem of fake users uh, and and you know false uh, or incorrect information, the identity problem goes uh, way beyond that. Uh, there is a problem of synthetic identity creation, which actually uh, requires you know, uh, identity creation by mix, uh, mixing and matching various different identity parameters. And one of the main drivers of that is, is you know, the, uh, the, the data breaches which happen across the uh, various industries. So if you look at how many data records have actually been breached since, uh, since two, 2013, you will actually find it's, uh, it's actually, the numbers is, is actually more than twice the world population, around 4.7 billion records have been breached. And uh, interesting part here is that out of them, around uh, just four percent of them were actually secure breaches. So that means they were encrypted with with a strong encryption uh, technique. Uh, but apart from that, most of them were in plain text, and and uh, they actually form a huge problem in terms of creation of 
uh, uh, synthetic identities. They actually drive synthetic identity creation. And um, of course, so, some of the main techniques which are used to do breaches are brute force attacks, man in, man in the middle attacks, malware attacks, but it can also be as simple as, you know, uh, a, a user mistake or, uh, you know, a, a technical mistake on a business's point of view, which actually uh, helped the bad guys get hold of uh, the data set. Yeah. Now, coming to the one time password inflation, which I talked about, uh, it, it's, it's, it has become a big problem. So what happens here is that uh, a business might actually see a huge, uh, you know, request in terms of the sign up attempts or registration attempts, the whole intent is to generate as many one-time passwords as possible, both SMS or voice one-time passwords to the numbers of which are connected to them commercially. And they actually earn from the termination rate, which is set onto those phone numbers in the, in, in the, in the destination country. Yeah. So they either own the numbers or they are a complice in, in, in with the company who actually owns that number right now. Um, so as, as you are aware uh, that, I mean, in telecom space, if there is a destination phone number, uh, there's a cost of termination, which is associated to that particular phone number. And this is what, uh, let's say, drives this fraud. So if you actually set up fraudulent numbers on the, on the end side or destination side, you actually can generate a uh, huge uh, one-time password or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, attacks on, on and inflate one-time passwords to generate the traffic to those numbers and actually earn out of it. Now, this is one problem which we have seen um, growing across the broad. Uh, it is not, uh, let's say, specific to any industry. All the industries, all our customers are actually facing this kind of a problem. And uh, it's, it's actually taking... Uh, I mean, it's actually taking a huge spike. And in these coronavirus times, we have actually seen it uh, uh, rising to, to, to a tremendous level. Now, if you talk about the impact of, you know, false identities or synthetic identities, or even the one-time password inflation problems, you will actually uh, find that, I mean, you'll actually be able to relate when I say that most of the businesses consider the impacts to be financial but the impacts actually go way beyond that. It actually increases cost of operations. It can increase cost of, you know, incident management. It can, uh, I mean, uh, increase cost of customer uh, experience. It, it can, uh, customer experience management, it actually generates uh, underlying KPIs so that the planning gets affected and so on and so forth. In some cases, it may also lead to uh, regulatory compliance issues and, and penalties associated with that. But on the user side, apart from direct financial losses, it actually affects uh, user experience. Uh, it, they can lead to loss of personal information. It affects, uh, in, in a lot of cases, their, their credit score. It affects, uh, you know, uh, the, the reputation of the business itself. And in some cases, it has also led to the risk in, uh, in, in personal security, even death in some, some cases. So uh, how to find the balance between you know, uh, the, I mean, ensuring that the onboarding is friction free, but still secure. Yeah. And if you look at, uh, if I, if I, if, if I may ask you a question, yeah. Uh, if I, if I want you to think about uh, when was the last time you actually changed your phone number, I'm sure that you will, you will, uh, most of you will think that it has been a few years, right? Uh, myself, I, I changed my phone number when I came to Belgium a few years back. But before that, I had no reason of changing the phone numbers. And with mobile number portability coming into picture, it actually has also uh, driven us to keep our phone numbers like forever, right? But most of us change our devices, add new devices on, on, a, on, on a regular basis. So the point here is that uh, considering that fact, the phone number has actually become a, a universally acceptable link to connect to any individual business service or even things. I mean, the, the internet of things uh, also have started using phone numbers as one of the parameters to, to recognize them, right? So a phone number can be a very good uh, way of knowing about your users well or, or also ensuring that you provide a, a seamless but secure onboarding. So for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to talk about how. 
So if you look at the phone number used currently across businesses, it's mostly being used for a verification purpose. Now, when I say verification purpose, uh, that means it's, uh, it's either the phone number possession verification. So that means if I actually onboard a particular user using a phone number, then uh, that, that particular uh, business would like to verify if I'm actually putting somebody else's phone number or that phone number is currently held by me. Right. So that's the reason why they may send one time password. Uh, it can also be used for account verification or, you know, the, the, the very traditional and very, uh, I mean, I mean, very much uh, a very mature case of transaction verification, right? The banks and the financial institutions also use it uh, often to ensure that the account updates are, um, you know, um, uh, the, the, the transaction or high value or risky transactions are supported by one time password um, um, uh, verification. So it has proven to be very effective in that area. But a phone number can say a lot more about a user than just verification. Yeah. So a phone number can be a, a big driver in, in actually identifying if that particular user has been part of any fraud incident in the past, right? What is its uh, current risky behavior? What type of number that is? When I say type of number, I'm going to get into a bit more detail in, in, in a while. Uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, what type of contract does he use, right? I mean, uh, when I say contract, that means is it a postpaid customer or prepaid customer? Um, since how long that has been connected to the mobile operator. All these are reputation and, and risk information which, the, which uh, a business can use while, while uh, onboarding a particular user. Apart from that, you can also perform subscription or uh, you know, uh, date of birth checks. You can perform a KYC check on, on the basis of phone number. Why? Because uh, most often uh, in, in most of the countries, the operators have also performed an ID check, uh, a validation of, of user before actually giving out a, a, a phone connection to them. So it can actually be a very strong driver to do a KYC check and can be quite useful for your compliance teams. So apart from that, you can also perform a status check if, if that particular, if, if a particular user um, user's phone number is currently active or deactive, right? If, if the phone number has been deactivated, then you may want uh, the user to change that to their current number because to ensure that uh, nobody else receives their one-time password after, after recycling, or you actually, if when your customer service teams try and um, uh, you know, reach to them, they actually reach the right person. Uh, apart from that, uh, there, there are many other checks, lifestyle checks and all which can actually be performed on, on, on the phone number. So if you look at uh, the success of phone number as the verification method itself, it has actually led to an increase in, in, in subscription. They have uh, proven to be very, very effective uh, in, in transaction verifications uh, in, in the past. Uh, if, you, if you believe the numbers posted by Google and Microsoft, you will see that almost 100% of uh, you know, uh, the, the account taker attempts or malicious transaction attempts can be throttled by using two-factor authentication like one-time passwords. Yeah. So, but uh, as, I, as I showed in the earlier slide, that's not the only uh, use of phone number which you can uh, utilize. You can actually, the phone number can actually be uh, a driver to get much more information about a user. But uh, even for uh, one-time password use for verification, uh, the fraudsters did not um, uh, stop, right? Uh, if you actually, uh, I mean, fraudster can still, if you actually use phone number as, as one of the verification methods for uh, phone number possession, there are ways fraudsters have identified by which they can actually bypass this, this verification check. They may not use physical SIMs. They can actually use, uh, S, uh, I mean, free SMS online numbers. They can use SIM farms by uh, where they actually uh, purchase SIM cards in bulk and actually use them to create bulk accounts. They can use burner phone numbers, the VoIP phone numbers, which are available online to, uh, to actually create accounts, right? By which they can, they do not have to leave any trace uh, if they actually get involved in any fraudulent activity, right? There's also a technique called as recycle hunting, which is uh, popular where uh, the fraudsters go uh, in the market to uh, get hold of recycled phone numbers by which they can actually get hold of a person's uh, associated account uh, with that phone number in any online website and receive one-time passwords on that. Yeah, uh, it all 
is driven by the fact that the telecom world is very, very complex. Uh, the number, uh, the numbering plans and the numbers itself are, are not black and white. There are very gray areas which exist in the telecom industry. The phone numbers can actually be created out of thin air. Um, there is uh, there's a huge problem identifying which phone numbers are currently allocated to the users, which uh, phone numbers are not. And, and that is something which actually drives most of the frauds in, in, in this space. So how can, uh, how can TeleSign help, right? So, if, so at TeleSign, we actually provide uh, the digital identity services where, uh, which actually revolves around phone number intelligence. So our, our phone number risk scoring product actually helps our customers identify the, the past phone number intelligence about uh, a phone number. And then um, it also captures or identifies the current usage behavior of that particular phone number, both in the online world and in the communication world, right? Uh, so that actually helps our customers to identify if a particular user is, is risky. If yes, then how much risk uh, that, that user's onboarding may entitle so that they can take uh, informed decisions, yeah? Apart from that, there are also very specific data attributes which we can actually provide to uh, our customers uh, based upon you know, ad hoc queries, which they can, um, they can request from our side uh, based upon a user lifecycle event, which uh, may have triggered in, 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 their, in their ecosystem. So for example, if they actually uh, see a person changing their uh, device and after that a, a, a high value transaction happens, that may actually indicate that the, the, the business has to ask for the you know, uh, uh, account takeover check such as SIM swap uh, SIM swap check or porting check. Yeah, uh, if they if if a user onboarding happens and subscription details are captured, then in that case the the customer can ask for a KYC check against uh, the operator records. So, uh, if you look at the main key features of Telesan Digital Identity Solutions, they evolve. Uh, they have four uh, main pillars. One is that our services have a strong machine learning capabilities built in to identify anomalous behavior, uh, risky behavior, and even trusted behavior of uh, a particular phone number, right? Uh, apart from that, we also provide real-time telecom operator checks because the number is actually owned, is, is a resource of a telecom operator, right? They are the right people to answer certain specific questions about a phone number, and we also provide that. That's all in, in real time. The KYC check, the SIM swap check, and other checks which I talked about is something which we provide in real time with uh, by connecting, interconnecting with that operator directly. Uh, we have access to the both online and the communication traffic of a particular user. And, and that also helps us uh, identify the behavioral or risk indicators about uh, a particular user. Right. Apart from that, we also have access to a comprehensive phone number intelligence database, a knowledge about past fraud phone numbers, which also is looked up to uh, identify if a particular phone number could be risky to your business. Yeah. Now, if I look at an onboarding flow, which, uh, which how an onboarding flow may look like if you utilize telesign services around phone number intelligence, uh, this is how it, it, it may appear, right? It's a, it's a very ideal uh, way of onboarding a user, but it can give you a gist of what, uh, what checks and balances you can perform. So let's say if you actually receive a registration request for a phone number, uh, at, at, uh, uh, at the start itself, you can actually perform a risk check or a score check uh, with, with, uh, with us to see if you even have to perform any other check or if you, if you have to provide a one-time password, send one-time password to the user to uh, ensure uh, that not only uh, saves cost, uh, but also ensures that you, you do not end up delaying uh, the, the onboarding process. So if the phone number has come out, came out to be of a higher risk, you may end the onboarding or uh, push the user to a higher friction route uh, in, in, in the onboarding process, right? But if you find a phone number to be, uh, to be fine, uh, the risk score to be fine, but is, is, is 
found to be part of the same phone number is, is found to be associated with any other account, then you actually can perform phone number recycling checks to ensure that uh, if that phone number is still valid to be associated with the old user. If not, then you can ask them to change their phone number. Uh, then you can actually perform the registration uh, check, the KYC check or contact check to see if, if uh, you know, what is the age of the uh, user if it is an age sensitive uh, application or service, you can actually uh, perform address checks, you can perform, um, you know, uh, the, the name check on, on the KYC data, which is owned by uh, the operators. Apart from that, you can also perform reputation check, which is very valid for financial companies, uh, micro lending companies, uh, where you may want to know how uh, reliable that particular user is uh, using the alternate data like uh, phone number. So uh, identifying if, I mean, to indicate a, a newly created prepaid number is much more riskier than an old phone number, which is maybe postpaid and has been proven to pay uh, his or her bill towards the telecom operator. Yeah, once everything is fine, you send the one-time password, confirm the position and the onboarding is complete. As you can see, most of the checks which we did are, uh, are, are in the back end. They do not hamper the customer onboarding. The customer has to enter very little information and uh, still they just have to, uh, you know, uh, in, in most of the cases, they just have to, uh, let's say, confirm the position through an OTP and the work is done. So frictionless onboarding is actually a rela uh, reality, but uh, if you use a phone number, it becomes, uh, let's say, much more easy to achieve. So right now we have a poll in front of you. So if you can maybe take a few seconds to answer that, that will be great. Okay. So if you look at some of our success stories around the world, you will find that we have helped a lot of businesses, online businesses, and even banks and other financial uh, industries to help identify their users much more holistically, much more comprehensively at the time of onboarding. So which has actually resulted in, in reduction in fraud, uh, which these users uh, or bad users uh, out of them may uh, may end up doing uh, in, in, in maybe a transactional stage or maybe in the customer engagement stage. Yeah. So, uh, so if you look at a fintech company uh, in Australia, we actually uh, end up reducing 52% uh, of fraud transactions by ensuring that the customer onboarding or the fraudsters are actually stopped at the gate. Yeah. For an online multi-utility company uh, in, in the CIS region, we were able to stop 70% of fraud registrations. Uh, for a mobility and delivery company out of Southeast Asia, we were able to stop 90% of fraud registrations uh, on their ecosystem. For a shared level company in, in, uh, in Europe, we were able to identify 82% plus uh, users' identity uh, accurately, uh, to which actually helped them identify risk of a particular user. Same story with uh, uh, with um, with with a company, a uh, large credit risk company in in US, and an online lodging company in uh, in uh, you know in 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 the Latam market. But uh, I mean, in in one of the leading uh, internet software companies, we were able to block 104 million. Uh, uh, we were able to provide 104 million block recommendations in just last one year. So I mean, most of the customers have actually got a high degree of reliability on customer identification and verification and 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 fraud risk identification by using our services. So with that, uh, I complete my story and uh, I will uh, give the baton back to Christina to uh, see if some of you have actually asked any questions during, during this session. Yeah, so we have a couple of questions. I've got a question from Valentina. Uh, so Abhijit, can you tell me more about how SIM swap happens? Oh, okay. So uh, SIM swap is, uh, is, is a way by which a particular okay so sim swap is is not a new technique right uh, it has existed in the industry for for valid reasons and when i say industry it's a telecom industry so let's say if you if you lose your sim or if you destroy your sim or or something happened to your sim card then a sim swap actually provides a technique to the user 
to port their phone number from the existing SIM to a new SIM card. Yeah. Now, but it also creates a problem or it actually uh, gives a tool to the fraudster to uh, to actually port a phone number of a valid user or the user they are trying to attack uh, to a SIM card which they might currently be holding. Right. So uh, in that case, they they will start receiving the uh, you know the the one time passwords or uh, or you know uh, uh, I mean those I mean they they would start be uh, they will start receiving the one time passwords and you know other verification messages which can help them take over a particular account of a user. Now uh, the way it is done is, is in most of the time it's it's a little uh, crude way, right? I mean. Uh, it can be very technical where you can actually get uh, somebody from the telecom company get involved uh, or make them your accomplice, which has happened in a lot of cases. But uh, in in but the crude way can be that you actually call a customer center and you uh, ask them or you prove to them that you are the user whom you are you are actually uh, impersonating. Right. So, so let's say if I have to attack Christina, I will actually call the mobile operator Christina and say, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I want to change my SIM, SIM card. I lost my SIM card. I currently have a SIM card uh, from your company. Can you please port my number to this SIM card? And what I have to give is my, my SIM card number. Now, in order to do that, I'll have to prove that I am Christina. Now, in, uh, in most of the cases, there are questions which I'm asked to verify myself. And they are like date of birth. Uh, what is my mother's maiden name? Or what's my first pet name? Now, if I connect that to uh, the the personal data breaches, which have happened in the industry, uh, it's not very dif uh, difficult to get hold of answers to those questions. Even social media scraping can actually uh, help answer those questions. And with that, uh, the customer center agent is is confident enough to actually port that uh, phone number to the SIM card which you're currently holding and by which uh, you can actually take over a particular SIM card. It's a very focused attack, but it's still very effective. So we've got another question in regards to SIM swap. So would you say that SIM swap is same as SIM cloning? No, SIM cloning is, uh, is, is different. So SIM cloning, frankly speaking, doesn't exist right now. SIM cloning was quite popular around 15 years back when uh, less, uh, I mean, where the encryption level uh, which were used on the SIM cards were not very effective, not very reliable. So the fraudster was able to break that. And, uh, and they were able to create different versions of the same SIM. Yeah. So if we were 15 years back, the, the, the fraudster would not even have uh, had to do SIM swap. They would, they may have just got uh, hold of the SIM of the, of the user by maybe theft or, or other techniques and would may have created a SIM uh, clone. But, these days, SIM cloning is SIM cloning essentially is duplication of the of the SIM card itself, where the both the SIM cards may exist at the at the same time. But that is uh, that is very different from 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 SIM swap. And right now, uh, SIM cloning is is something which we don't see happening around the world because of the the encryption techniques being used on the SIM cards. Uh, yeah, so that has actually helped resolve the problem. Okay, great. So uh, we've got a question from Rakesh. Do you have any existing customers in India? And do you have any tie up with any of the telecom operators here? Yes. So answers to, uh, to both the questions are yes. Now, um, if, you, if you talk about our experience with uh, dealing with Indian phone numbers, we have been dealing with Indian phone numbers forever. Uh, so, uh, I mean, but, uh, so, yeah, so we have, you know, a ride sharing company, we have e commerce companies who actually utilize our services for Indian numbers. So uh, a lot of companies utilize our uh, risk score service to identify if an Indian phone number is is risky. We also provide a uh, connection to operator records uh, to identify uh, certain data points about a particular phone number. Okay, uh, we have one more. So how do you validate your risk score? How do we validate? Oh, okay. Uh, so, of course, I mean, customer feedback is one of the most important data points which goes into risk score, right? We always, uh, I won't say always, but most of the time when we talk about our effectiveness of the services, customers uh, like to try it out, right? So we 
uh, we most of the time engage in a, in a proof of concept uh, in, a, in a lot of cases do, uh, do let's say a very custom test for our customers to and the results of which are then validated by the customers in terms of identifying how much benefit they are going to get out of it or, or what is the false positive rate of course right and uh, and a feedback from their side also helps improve the effectiveness of, of our services our machine learning models can also learn out of the feedback which comes from the customer so they keep improving so but of course the customer validation is is the key yeah in a in a lot of cases an education also goes uh, from our side towards the customers because they may not be aware uh, what uh, let's say if a particular phone number is is good or bad because uh, you know they may not be aware if the phone number is VoIP or a receive SMS online number so uh, for them if a transaction has happened and not a chargeback request hasn't come on that for some time they might term it as good but the inherent uh, risk of the phone number remains and they might be uh, you know establishing a reputation towards themselves by by making some transactions and they might be uh, getting ready for for a big attack so uh, so yeah a, a lot of times it happens that we also have to educate over the riskiness of the number itself uh, and so uh, that also happens in 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 a lot of cases okay so since we're over time uh, can we move to the reward part and to all of the questions that we got we will answer via email so uh, our $500 question is, what are the two techniques fraudsters use to bypass OTP verification? Can you please submit your, uh, your answers through uh, Zoom chat box Q&A and the winner will receive a voucher in the value of $500. Okay, so this question was covered during the session. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's wait a little bit more. Okay, Colin, do you know maybe the second one? Perfect. Uh, so Colin uh, is our winner and we will uh, we'll get in touch with you after the webinar via email to discuss and agree on the reward collection. 